Welcome to the Cannabis News and Views program. Today I am speaking with Julian Buchanan, a man who has worked in the drug awareness field for over three decades. Looking back to the 1980s, Julian's work began as a social services provider in Liverpool, then into probation work for 15 years, where he held many jobs. One most notably as a drug specialist taking part in the first harm reduction practices assisting heroin addicts known as the Merseyside model. This before his work as a lecturer, researcher and program director establishing criminal justice programs for three universities in England and then re-establishing himself on the other side of the globe at the Institute of Criminology at Victoria University in Wellington, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Buchanan has lectured and written extensively about drug law reform. His WordPress site lists his writings, ranging from journal articles to an ongoing blog. Articles such as the drug policy sham to 16 groups that benefit from prohibition provide information supporting drug policy changes in respect to social, health, and human rights. Julian, how would you describe what more and more people are calling a drug apartheid? I use the term drug apartheid because we have embraced a whole faction of drugs and we have separated and hidden underground and ridiculed and, and given a lot of misinformation to keep a whole section of other drugs out of the system. And there is no logical reason to make sense of this. The drugs which were on the other side of the apartheid, the drugs which are powerless, the drugs which are punished and policed, and the drugs which are subject to propaganda and misinformation, many of those drugs are safer than alcohol and tobacco. But privileging alcohol and tobacco, it's a strange choice. It's a cultural choice, and we've grown up with politically and culturally, and it's quirky the way it's evolved that way. But anything rational would choose a different drug. You wouldn't choose alcohol, which is poisonous. So it's a complete nonsense, the situation we've got. And the way in which we operate as a society with these substances is like an apartheid. It is illogical. I think the misinformation has continued so long that the people who use the privileged drugs, who live in the privileged arena, who use legal drugs, just don't understand at all the domain and the existence of the illicit drugs because it's so entrenched and it's so dominant. Now, I'm one of those people who's never, I've never used an illegal drug in my life. I'm not somebody who promotes this view because I secretly enjoy a spliff. I've never done an illicit drug in my life, so I've come to this perspective through having worked in the field for many years and I've seen the nonsense of it all. So drugs like, say, LSD or ecstasy, drugs like magic mushrooms, they pose a lot less harm pharmacologically than, say, drugs like tobacco and alcohol. Yet in the UK and in New Zealand, if you're caught supplying one of those drugs, you could be sent to prison for life. It's very strange the way in which we have created this system of drugs which we can use, which have been promoted and approved by the government or by society, and the drugs which are frowned upon and face very serious consequences if you're caught in possession or supply. One of the greatest harms is the criminalization of young people. The young people are being criminalized for possessing a particular substance, for possessing a plant, for possessing uh, particular mushrooms. And that doesn't make sense. And that criminal conviction will ruin their life. They'll struggle to maybe to, to travel, maybe they'll struggle to get employment, maybe they'll struggle to get housing. Uh, because of drug apartheid, there would be a cultural system that would operate within the community where if, if this young man or this young girl has a record for a drug's possession, then they might be isolated within the community because of the stigma associated with particular substances. So the young person who has maybe a bit of a drink problem and gets a bit loutish and, and maybe gets a bit abusive or a bit aggressive with the other young people, would not be stigmatized or isolated as much as the other young person who maybe is known to regularly smoke cannabis. And that's all part of the nonsense of the drug apartheid. So there are structural 
consequences, but there are also cultural and personal consequences to young people. I've argued that really drug policy is causing more problems than the actual drugs themselves. It's not to say that drugs don't cause problems. We can all develop problems with different things, and alcohol can cause problems. But we have presented drugs as some sort of demonised substance that possess this incredible power, and they don't. What are some of your concerns regarding law enforcement, prohibition, and this drug apartheid? Here in New Zealand, we send out police helicopters, and we send out the New Zealand Air Force, and they go round digging up cannabis that's growing wild in the countryside. And they spend millions and millions of dollars and time searching for our plants and digging plants up. Well, I would much prefer that the police and the law enforcement agency had a little bit more time and money, and they used that time and money to help people who've been subject to burglaries or violence or abuse. Real and crime. The, the real crime. Well, crime where there are real victims because a lot of drug law enforcement crime is victimless crime. And if people have got addiction problems, which people will have, and drugs can ruin people's lives, and that's a fact, then those people need help. But they need help from the social care and health agencies, not from the law enforcement agencies. Just like people with problems with obesity, we don't need the police to come round. We don't need the law enforcement for people who have problems with overeating and obesity. It's a health and social care issue. So it's not to deny there are problems with substances, it's to directly appropriate agencies and services. Most of the stories and the pictures and the evidence that we show are really illustrations of prohibition and abstinence and tough enforcement upon drug users. It's a tragedy that people have been denied not just pleasure, leisure and relaxation, but people have also been denied therapeutic help, which would be afforded to them had they been able to access some of these illegal drugs for medicinal benefits. And instead, they've been given pharmaceutical drugs, which have often caused more problems and not alleviated their harm. It's another major concern around the prohibition. The prohibition has denied people, sometimes denied people life, there's that famous case of Charlotte Figgy, who was having hundreds of grand mal seizures and petty mal seizures with her epilepsy every week and uh, almost lost her life a couple of times. But uh, Charlotte Figgy responded to a, a high level of CBD cannabis and uh, her life has been massively improved by giving her cannabis oil. It's a great tragedy that many people have not had the benefits of being able to try cannabis oil for uncontrollable epilepsy. How awful is that? Well, it's, it's, it's crimes against humanity, actually. It know? is. And I'd well, like to know who the people are to be made accountable for these decisions over the last 50 years, because when we really sit down and look at the damage that has been done just in that area of prohibiting the medical use of these yes. substances, uh, these plants. And, and cannabis has got wide use for multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's and a whole range of, of oh. different... But your point there about crimes against humanity is an interesting one because I talk about a drug apartheid. And if this apartheid is recognized and seen for what it is, and if we abolish, like we abolish slavery, and we seek to have an abolitionist approach as opposed to inviting cannabis to the top table, but we seek to abolish prohibition, then we could see ourselves moving into a position where we need to apologize for the crimes that we've committed. And we could see ourselves in a position where we need to recompense the people that we've damaged. You know, the people who've been incarcerated for growing their own cannabis, the people who've been incarcerated for supplying drugs or for possessing drugs. So it's an interesting move when you frame what we have as crimes against humanity, as a a perverse and distorted system which should never have been allowed to have been implemented. If you frame it like that, then we do need to think about how we pay back the people that we've damaged. Mm -hmm. Well, reconciliation. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right, that's right, and that's, that's why if we see it as a system of drug apartheid, we then have a language and a concept which is a bit more fitting for what's happened. 
and might be a bit more fitting for thinking about how we tackle what's happened. We need to abolish the apartheid. In regards to abolishing the drug apartheid, where do we go from here? So we've got two problems. We've got cultural problems of the way in which we see, understand, relate to, perceive illegal drugs. But we also have the other problem of the law and the structures. And so we need to address both of those issues in respect of fully accommodating all drugs and ending the drug apartheid. So we end the drug apartheid and we stop privileging particular drugs and we create a level playing field and we regulate and we make available all drugs. But we then need very considerable and very well-informed health education and information so that people will know what they're doing and know what the risks are. There's a journal article by Professor David Nutt published in The Lancet, and this group of experts did this piece of research and they looked at all the different drugs. They rated them all in terms of different categories of harm, and the drug which was the most harmful out of the whole lot was a drug called alcohol or ethanol. So we've already accommodated the most dangerous drug that's available. So we can accommodate all the substances and give very sound and solid information. And we need to stop promoting them. The way in which, which we promoted alcohol, tobacco and, and caffeine is a disgrace, really. What about racism and discrimination in this drug apartheid? It's often people of colour who are targeted. I haven't got any figures before me for Canada, but I certainly know for the UK, for the US of A, and for New Zealand, people of colour are disproportionately targeted when it comes to stops and searches by the police. The people who are stopped and arrested and prosecuted, the chances are much greater if you are a person of colour in those three Anglophile countries. And it's probably the case for Canada as well, but I don't have any figures to support that. The levels of drug use amongst the white population compared to the black population are at least comparable. And I think in one of the countries, it's actually slightly less amongst the people of colour. So I'm just making the point that levels of use are not greater amongst the black population or the people of colour. But in UK, New Zealand, and in the US of A, the people of colour are something between three and seven times more likely to be stopped and searched, arrested, prosecuted, and incarcerated. So here in New Zealand, for example, we've got 14% of the population are Māori, but they make up 51% of the prison population. And wherever you go, in whichever country you go to, you'll see people of colour and Indigenous people overrepresented. I don't know of a country where that's not the case. And drug laws and drug possession laws are a very useful means or a convenient way for stopping, searching, and arresting these people. So I think removing that opportunity isn't going to solve the problem, but it will actually help towards making it more difficult for people of colour to be stopped and searched. Julian, looking back on the 1980s in England, please describe the social and working conditions surrounding what was called back then the, quote, drug epidemic and how harm reduction models started to replace the abstinent-based drug rehab cycle of drug enforcement still being used today in many parts of the world? There's lots in that question, really. I think the first part of that question is the social context of what was regarded as a drug epidemic. And I think the social context is important because it helps us to appreciate some of the root causes of drug dependence and addiction. And the social context in the UK, I was working in Liverpool in a suburb called Bootle as a probation officer at the time. And that was in the mid-1980s. And uh, basically there was mass unemployment occurring where huge shipyards, factories, labour-intensive industry, coal mines, they were all closing down under what was uh, Thatcherism, who was the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, at the time. And uh, what happened was that there were loads of communities where the parents were becoming unemployed for the first time, which was an unknown thing because people had previously always had jobs. 
and maybe at that time had assumed really they would be working for most of their lives, if not their entire life. And then their children who were leaving school also realized that they were not going to get jobs either. Some of these communities, unemployment was 60, 80 percent. And that was the case in the Bukla area I was working. And what happened then is that there became a new wave of heroin addiction. In the 60s and 70s, people had used drugs, and really people have always used drugs. But in terms of a widespread use of substances, in the 60s and 70s, it was the students and taking drugs to enhance life. But in the 80s, in Bukla, all of a sudden, these young people without work, wandering around the streets, they started using drugs not to enhance their life, which is what the students did. They took drugs to enhance their perceptions, to en- help them to enjoy the, the festival or the music or one another. In the 80s in Bukla, these working class unemployed youth who couldn't sell their labour, they were taking drugs in order to escape from life, in order to blot out from life. So they were seeking what I call a euphoric oblivion, and they were taking a drug that just sent them to sleep and took away their pain. Basically, the drug itself is a fantastic painkiller, heroin. And that was a major problem, and people thought they were all going to die, and that's what drugs did. That leads me to the second part of your question, which is developing the harm reduction approach. For me, I was a young probation officer trying to do my best to help these young lads who were on probation to me. And I was pressurizing them to give up drugs. I was telling them that drugs were going to ruin their life and drugs would ultimately kill them. And everybody was telling them that. The newspapers, the families, the family support groups that set up. We were all sending out the message that if you don't get yourself sorted, you're going to die on drugs. So it was an abstinence approach, and that was the perceived wisdom in the early 80s. I realized I was actually messing people's lives up because I was really putting them under pressure and forcing them to say that they wanted to become drug-free when they didn't have any interest in becoming drug-free or they were not ready or able or wanting to become drug-free. And what was happening is I was telling the courts and the magistrates and the judges, give them a chance, they promised they'll become drug-free. And they were only saying what I had forced them to say. And they were only doing what they were being pressurised to do. And as you know, you can't make changes under those circumstances. I was taking people off to rehabs, and within weeks, they would be back in the same area doing drugs. And in that sense, I realized I was part of the problem. I was setting them up to fail. And once they had failed, they were in a bigger mess, and they were more alienated. So that's when I started looking at an alternative approach and looking at addiction differently in terms of a socio-psychological context. In England, back in the 80s, Did you see positive results in the community and among the youth in regards to lowering heroin use due to those harm reduction efforts? What we did see is considerable progress. I was fortunate to be looking at the situation and seconded by the Merseyside Probation Service as a drug specialist. And uh, that involved me working with other groups at the same time. So I was fortunate to work with a Dr. John Mark who was a psychiatrist who started prescribing injectable heroin and injectable methadone and giving drug users oral methadone on a long-term maintenance basis. And we started giving drug users clean needles. So in the probation office where we worked, uh, we set up a satellite clinic and uh, we were prescribing drugs there and we were giving clean needles and giving condoms. And so that was really part of what was later known as the Mersey model. A group of us had set that up. And did we see progress? Did we see uh, lowering of drug use? I'm not sure we had any impact on the lowering of drug use in the area. Possibly we did, but we didn't really measure it. The most profound and, in my view, the most important thing was that we saw lives that were being changed because... No longer did the people I was working with have to wear a mask and tell lies. I was actually being able to engage with people therapeutically in a counselling relationship where they could be honest, uh, where they could speak the truth, where they could feel cared for, and where we could give them services which would significantly reduce the harm for their lives. So that I would have somebody on probation uh, who would be 
having to go around shoplifting every day to generate enough money and then would have to tell lies and pretend they're not on drugs. What would happen is I could give them a prescription and, and uh, it would be signed by the doctor, not by me. But I would decide and chat with the doctor what would be an appropriate level and say where they were at and how they were progressing. But that person then wouldn't need to go out shoplifting. So crime did reduce and uh, people's lives did change and people became stable and they began to, to remove themselves from the criminal underworld where they were having to engage to acquire their drugs. And then they were also using clean drugs as well. So we did see a lot of, of positive change. It was some of the best years of my working life in terms of seeing people change. I saw lots of people in tears when I interviewed them because it was sometimes the first time that anybody had given them space to be able to be properly honest. And many said, nobody's really understood my situation before. Nobody's ever really listened to me before. Because under the abstinence regime, they had to pretend and give the answers that the person in power wanted them to say. So they were always second-guessing what the answer might be and delivering that answer. Whereas once we adopted harm reduction, they could just say wherever they were at. And as long as we were reducing risk, I would work with them and support them to reduce risk. Sounds like there was a big turn there for you in your working life. It was a big turn, and uh, it was a major change. And from that Merseyside model, and I'm not the person who instigated it, I was one of a number of people. Dr. John Marks was as a key player, and there were others in Merseyside who were key players. But, but that was a key change for me, uh, and in many respects I've never stopped writing about it and uh, researching it. But it's also a big change globally, because Merseyside launched a harm reduction conference, and that conference, I think, is now in its, maybe it's in its 22nd conference now. It's in Malaysia, and there'll probably be around 3,000 people there attending the conference in Malaysia. The first conference was held in Liverpool, and the International Journal of Group Policy, the first publication of that journal came from Liverpool, from that group of people. So the whole model of harm reduction, of prescribing that what was originally known as the British system, but it was resurrected in Merseyside and harm reduction and the, the heroin-assisted uh, therapy, which was subsequently adopted in Switzerland. It all began in Merseyside, so it was quite pioneering work, yes. Unfortunately, the old abstinence, what I think in the US sometimes you call tough love, were confronting people and letting them hit rock bottom and then telling them that they need to become abstinent and they need to be abstinent all their life. That was the approach that, that was peddled in the early 80s, which I found didn't work and caused more harm than good. But that approach, unfortunately, is still being used across many countries and even where I am now in New Zealand. So abstinence and pushing tough love still continues. So there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of promoting harm reduction. Julian, do you support the legalization and regulation of all drugs? What I would advocate is a system where we don't promote and approve and encourage particular drugs, particularly those dangerous drugs like alcohol and tobacco, but neither do we punish people for using the unapproved drugs because the system of approval and unapproval is a complete mess and it's very misleading and we're promoting the wrong drugs. People should not be punished for the possession of drugs and then encouraged to take other legal drugs. So we have a funny system in our society where people are encouraged to so-called celebrate with legal drugs. But I would say that there are vested interests in yes. maintaining the status quo. And obviously once you've got a huge industry where we perceive alcohol and caffeine and to a lesser extent these days tobacco as being the expressions of leisure and pleasure, relaxation, occasion, celebration, then clearly those industries benefit and uh, uh, it's in their interest to maintain that privileged position and that monopoly. So I would favour a system which decriminalised all drugs and then allowed people to possess any substance that they wanted for personal use and then regulate the businesses that, that supply those substances. 
whichever system you go down, my key point would be that we must never ever involve or invoke any penalties or offences for personal possession. So I would favour decriminalisation and ultimately legalisation and regulation. One of your recent articles is called 16 Groups Who Benefit from Prohibition. Yeah, I wrote that, uh, that short piece on my blog uh, around the 16 benefits or 16 groups that benefit from prohibition because I've been trying to combat prohibition and create a more humane and rational evidence-based drug policy for probably about 35 years now. And I think it occurred to me that we're tackling the problem from the wrong direction. We keep presenting evidence constantly to say prohibition doesn't work more people are still using illegal drugs and the supply of illegal drugs is not diminishing. So simply on a rational basis that if use and supply isn't diminishing, therefore we need to end prohibition. And I think that's a good logical argument and I support the argument. But what I'm saying in these 16 groups of benefit is there could be something quite different that is sustaining drug prohibition. And there's little point in trying to persuade people of the merits of giving up prohibition if the merits of prohibition are something very, very different. And I see now that what we have created in prohibition is a huge industry with a lot of beneficiaries from that industry. And until we actually start to expose and name and identify those beneficiaries, then we're not going to make much progress on prohibition. And so we do have this huge penal industrial complex and we have this huge drug abstinence industry of the rehabs and the the drug testing business. It's a great vote winner for shouting against these enemies within. So it's a great one to say Baltimore in the US or if you've got any big cities or any areas in a community which are incredibly deprived And if you find it an incredibly deprived community, then you're inevitably going to find a lot of addiction and drug dependence. And then if you can moan and groan about it's all caused by drugs and it's the addicts and it's these illicit drugs, we need a war on drugs, then it can be a way of rallying the community together against this enemy within. And so prohibition has given the politicians and the community a rally call and a great way of of winning votes and gaining public support against this perceived enemy. Addiction is an enemy, but we've created a lot of it ourselves. The prohibition has lots of benefits for different people, and what I'm doing there is trying to illustrate the way in which prohibition has a, a strong political leverage, in which case politicians will want to continue prohibition because mm-hmm. they can keep spouting a mantra of hatred towards illicit drugs, the drug war, we're going to get tough, and they can out each other on, on this demonised substances that have been made illicit. So we have to understand the wider socio-political context of illicit drugs and the way in which prohibition benefits a lot of people. And uh, it's a very sexy image for mainstream media to show all our support the politicians. They really know what's good for the citizens. That's right. You've just identified another group that benefits, which is the media. The mainstream media. uh, They can sell their media by portraying these extreme stories. Most of the stories are just part of the propaganda of prohibition. So prohibition is able to spawn all this industry of panic and fear. Do you think there are constructive ways that the general public can respond to these ongoing lies, myths, in misinformation that are at the core of prohibition and this global drug war? It's a really tough question, really. How do we tackle and what can the individual do? It it sounds very trite, but I think the best thing that we can do is talk and educate. And I think the more we can talk and bring things out in the open, and sometimes that means challenging as well. Just let me put it a different way. The regime that we're talking about originates in the 1950s, and we've still got it. Well, back in the 1950s, we saw the official dominant discourse for people of colour was racist. The official dominant discourse for women was sexist. 
the official dominant discourse for people with mental health problems was disgraceful and prejudicial. So I think the best way to understand it is perhaps to go back and think, how have we made progress on tackling racism and tackling sexism and tackling homophobia? Because in relation to drugs, we've got the same issues. It's the same type of problem. Mm -hmm. It's endemic, structural, cultural and personal discrimination and misinformation and prejudice around illicit drugs and people who use illicit drugs. How do we tackle that? Well, we tackle it by demonstration. We tackle it by dissemination of sound information. We tackle it by challenging and confronting people at times in a way that is helpful and educational. We tackle it by talking. And eventually things will begin to change. But it's hard work when it's so embedded as these discriminations have been embedded. Mm -hmm. So I think if we see it in terms of how would we tackle racism and sexism and all the other issues, that's the best way to understand, as I see it, the situation we have in relation to illicit drugs. It's just another scapegoat. Yes, that's right. And scapegoats and discrimination, sexism, what they've all got is they've got people in positions of power and privilege who want to maintain that power and privilege. And that's what you have. Whenever you look at a system of discrimination, there are people in power and privilege who are benefiting. So we have to understand that power and privilege. And I guess that's why I talk about the 16 groups that benefit from prohibition. Unless we expose and tackle the power and privilege of maintaining the status quo, then we're not going to address the problem. Next April 2016, the United Nations is having their special session on drugs. Uh, We would like to think that they would update their 1960s single treaty on drugs. That was another big, uh, big nail in the coffin of prohibition and the drug war, as we know it, for the last 50 years. What's happened in the North American continent is that people finally just said, sorry, feds, we're opening our dispensaries and we're going to sell this medical marijuana. You know, we're going to create these alternatives. Do you see that people can create alternatives and stop prohibition now? I guess at the end of the day, we're talking about pragmatism and strategy, and which would be the best way forward. And Mm -hmm. there will be some people who will pursue the global UN system. From my perspective, I am deeply cynical. And the bottom line is that the UN should never have been involved in the first place in developing a treaty on illicit drugs and encouraging punishment of particular drugs in the 1961 convention. And as you say, that was really something that nailed down prohibition and really cemented prohibition across the globe. But they should never have been involved. And I think Canada should have autonomy over what Canada chooses to do with its laws generally. I think there should be very, very few laws that the United Nations or a global organization should dictate as to what Canada can and can't do in terms of its own legal system. I don't know if Canada or New Zealand would ever give up its sovereignty and invite a United Nations to direct it in respect of particular substances or plants. It seems bizarre to me. It seems completely ludicrous. Well, sounds so, like a global police state happening. Well, it, it, it was all propaganda. It was, it was all a complete nonsense at the time. Oh. And it was to do with privileging and maintaining the position of tobacco Mm. largely and Harry Anslinger in the U.S. So it was a very U.S.-led arrangement Mm -hmm. uh, back in the 50s, really, pulled together into a single convention. Going back to your question, John, I would say that the way forward is for countries to simply do and rebel and to create their own legislation and to not be worried about what the U.N. are saying or doing around drugs. Yes, I mean, we can have a twin-track approach and we can have some people who can try and work with the UN. But ultimately, for the UN, I think it should be abolished. Not the UN, but the UN ODC. The branches of the UN that concern themselves with what we call illicit drugs. And there's no pharmacological basis for the drugs that they've got on their list. So it's not like we've got any biological, pharmacological understanding or scientific basis to what they've listed under the UN Convention, 
A drug is simply those things which are listed on their list. So it's complete nonsense, really, that needs to be... In my view, we, we should abolish the whole UNODC and, and all the various committees that spawn from that. And then each country should be free to make its own rules and laws around substances in the way that you should be able to around, you know, tea or coffee or, or alcohol. Or even our um, other healing herbs and vitamins that's right, and that's supplements. That's right, a whole pile of, of herbs. Yeah, that's right. There's a whole raft of substances. And if, if we take a logical approach, we either abolish it or we say every substance has to be approved by the state. And I could imagine a world where we could move down that road, and that would be a worrying road, where I could only grow what was approved by the state. You know, I could only consume what's approved by the state. And that's not a road we should go down. We should be completely free. In mm. terms of how do we do things, I've started using in the last four or five years a lot of social media, and that's partly why I'm giving this interview now, is because I think writing articles and publishing in journals and writing books and speaking at conferences has merit, and being part of the UN and speaking at the UN, which, which I've done, has got merit. But really, it's an inertia which has very little exposure in the wider world. And mm. so I think this change is going to occur in terms of our breaking down drug prohibition and decriminalization and ultimately legalization. I don't think it's going to occur through journal articles, conferences or the UN. I think it's going to occur through a mass awareness and insight and pressure from the public. So I think the best way forward, as I see it, is social media and a mass movement of people demanding, like they have in a number of states, and they've demanded that uh, the cannabis should be legalized, and it has been legalized. I do believe that Bolivia was a country that turned... Well, in, in Bolivia, the president went to the United Nations and he chewed a coca leaf, because a coca leaf is what we derive cocaine from. It's illegal to chew a coca leaf. And he did it in the UN meeting itself and said this is a nonsense. Then the president of Bolivia withdrew from the UN convention and then signed up again with the exception of coca. So yes, that's the other way of doing it, is to simply withdraw from the convention and sign up on your own terms. If the political will is there, the government can do it. But while we have benefits in prohibition, and um, communities and the public will be confused by the war on drugs. Until we can actually disseminate the truth, then the politicians will still be able to, and will still struggle to, change the, the regulations within the UN. So I think it's important that we try to disseminate the truth around all drugs and cannabis. I think the truth is spilling out on cannabis, but it mustn't stop there. It needs to spill out on all substances. Julian, what actions do you suggest listeners do in these times? We've now got ways to actually break down the dominant discourses, which might have previously been largely peddled by stuff like Fox News or whatever. Now people can listen to this podcast. I can circulate this podcast in New Zealand, and I can circulate it on my Twitter account. And the Facebook group I set up on Book Society Harm Reduction and Human Rights which I think is probably getting near 4,000 people across the globe have connected with so I can disseminate it there. And they might disseminate it onto their Facebook groups. For me, this is a good way of breaking down the discrimination. And discrimination is upheld with misinformation and prejudice and lies. Uh, and that's why I've got another blog, which is called 60 Lies, Myths and Misinformation, the Drug Policy Sham. And they're all efforts that I've been making in the last five years particularly to try to break down and to disseminate debate and evidence and truth so that we can build a drug policy and knowledge on a solid foundation rather than on the propaganda that people have been given. Thanks, Julian, for talking with me today. And for more info, check out julianbuchanan.wordpress.com and look for him on Facebook and Twitter for more of his articles on prohibition and the global drug war. This has been Jana Juniper G. with the Cannabis News and Views program, care of CFUV Radio, online at cfuv.uvic.ca. And thanks for listening.